So essentially one of the earliest uh, frameworks was the so-called cognitive framework. And it starts from the uh, point of departure that processes actually take place within the mind when you're making a decision and your behavior is purposeful and it's directed towards a goal. So it has to do with the relationship between the cognitive environmental cues and your expectations. So in, uh, in, in this uh, situation, you're kind of uh, placing an expectancy that a particular event will lead to a particular consequence. So how Tolman got to this conclusion was he had a maze and he was trying to get rats to go through a maze. And what he had was he was trying to stimulate them to do this by putting food at the end of the maze. And when he changed the stimulus, they started to behave differently. So let me kind of uh, illustrate this to you with this uh, graph here. So you have you had three different types of situations uh, that they recorded. So the first type of situation is the rats were rewarded at the end of the maze, and that meant that they started to uh, learn it. The second situation was that they didn't have a reward, and then uh, it, they improved slightly, but they didn't improve a lot because uh, getting out was a fairly small reward. And finally, you had a group where you had a delayed reward, uh, and that actually meant that the rats started to do well rapidly when the rewards started appearing, and they started performing even better. So if you look at this graph here, you kind of understand how it started to work out. So uh, the uh, group of rats that were rewarded, they were just gradually getting better, and the group of rats uh, that didn't get a reward were pretty much stuck here. They got a little bit better, but not really. Uh, and then the group with the delayed reward, while they didn't get a reward, they weren't very interested in getting better at solving, at kind of uh, uh, get, finding a way out of the maze. And when the reward was introduced here, uh, starting on day 11, they actually started being much more motivated to get out of the way of the maze more quickly and all of the accumulated knowledge or information here actually came into play. So essentially what we're learning is that uh, according to this theory there's a cognitive process in the mind that associates a certain kind of pattern of action with a certain outcome that you, you achieve in the end and this reward motivates you to uh, do better. Now, the second type of framework that I wanted to go through with you is the behavioristic framework. And it's illustrated famously by Pavlov's dog that we're going to talk about in a second. So the uh, behavioristic framework underlines the importance of dealing with observable behavior instead of the elusive mind that preoccupied earlier psychologists. So basically, in the earlier example with the rats, what we saw was an analysis of the behavior that takes place in the mind. So we were kind of seeing these results and we were trying to guess what's going on in the mind of the rats in this situation. Whereas uh, with the behavioristic framework, you're trying to deal with much more observable um, phenomena. So essentially what you had was the classical conditioning experiment and you formulated the response to certain stimulus. So the way that uh, it was uh, introduced was through Pavlov's dog that I just mentioned to you, and the process went through the following stages. So first of all, you had a dog and food, and you knew that when you give food to the dog, or you know when it sees the food, it starts to salivate, right? And this is what we call an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response. Why? Because naturally the dog starts to salivate when it sees food. It's naturally a stimulus for the dog and the salivation is a natural reaction. So they're unconditioned. You don't need to condition these things in order to, for them to happen. Now the second kind of uh, point of departure here is you had a bell and you had uh, the dog. So that's kind of a neutral stimulus. Why? Because naturally the dog doesn't respond to the bell or not respond to the bell, it's just a bell. And uh, there's no salivation when the dog hears the bell. 
So this is what we call a neutral stimulus here. It's something that's not naturally stimulating the dog and it's a neutral response. So it's basically a not, not a conditioned response. It's, it's not any kind of any significant response actually because nothing happens when it hears the bell. And what, what Pavlov did was uh, he started uh, ringing the bell and uh, giving the dog food. So what happened here was he started getting an unconditioned response at the beginning. Why? Because the dog was salivating because of the food. But every time the dog got the food, the bell also rang. So gradually the dog started associating the bell with the food and that's what we call classical conditioning. And, and in the end it started to salivate when it heard the bell and this is what we call a conditioned stimulus now because we conditioned the dog to learn this and it's a conditioned response now because a response that was actually natural to begin with is now observed uh, when a, an, un, an unnatural phenomenon happens uh, to stimulate the dog. So essentially you ended up from a situation where the dog was salivating when it saw food to a situation where the dog was salivating when it heard the bell. And this is what we call in psychology classical conditioning and it also plays into uh, organizational behavior as we're going to discuss later. So these two models, the behaviorist model and the cognitive model, uh, differ in a certain number of of ways so in the behaviorist model you have stimulus in the environment whereas in the cognitive model you have input from the environment now in the behaviorist model what happens after that stimulus is something that is uh, more or less a black box and uh, we don't think it, it can be uh, studied or we don't think that uh, it's something that we need to spend a lot of time on what we're essentially looking at is we're looking at the response at the end we're looking at the behavior that we're getting at the end um, and with the cognitive model, we're essentially having input from the environment and then we go through a mediational process, uh, some kind of a mental event, and then we uh, get the output or behavior. So uh, essentially, if you look at these two models again, uh, the cognitive framework was the uh, experiment with the rats where we are looking at kind of that mental process of the reward when they get out of the maze. And if you're looking at the, uh, uh, the the classical conditioning model, what you're seeing is uh, is uh, this behaviorist model here, where you have stimulus and then you have a response, and we don't uh, kind of focus that much in particular on what's in the middle, what's kind of in the black box. So you also have another type of conditioning which is called operant or instrumental conditioning and it's something that uh, you perhaps when you were younger you saw quite naturally in terms of family relations or from your parents so consequences uh, here basically uh, lead to changes in voluntary behavior and you can you can add uh, positive or negative reinforcement in terms of a stimulus to a person so for instance in, in the simplest possible example if you have a child that doesn't want to do their homework and you can tell them if you do your homework you can go and have cake this is what we call positive reinforcement here or you can also have negative reinforcement where you take away some form of stimulus so say the kid has a certain toy that uh, maybe he or she likes and you can tell the kid well if you don't eat your dinner uh, you can't go and play with your toy so that's kind of negative stimulus you're taking away the stimulus from that kid uh, you can also have uh, some sort of punishment uh, that's kind of you know an, an additional burden that you put on the person uh, in any case what you're doing here is essentially you're tying the person's pattern of action to the consequences and and this is uh, not a pattern of action that you're forcing on them you're leaving a choice for them but uh, now they know that depending on what they do they're gonna get very different outcomes so you have changes in their voluntary behavior based on the consequences and this is what we call operant or instrumental conditioning and finally we have this uh, idea of a social cognitive uh, framework so what social cognitivists say is that uh, behaviorist and operant conditioning and all of these types of things that we saw basically framed around if x then z or if 
if I do Z then X or whatever. Uh, these things aren't being criticized as too mechanistic here. They're being thought of something that's kind of too formulaic, uh, uh, too direct in terms of the relationships that they study. And uh, what they try to integrate is uh, they try to integrate uh, social contribution, cognitive processes. So here's a quote from Bandura that kind of explains the idea. It is largely through their actions that people produce the environmental conditions that affect their behavior in a reciprocal fashion. So essentially what Bandura is saying is that you're not only talking about um, a relationship that's between uh, kind of going from A to B, for example, but what you're doing is you're looking at people's actions and then you have the environment and then you have this kind of relationship that's going back and forth between the actions and the environment that people are in. And this is what we call a social cognitive framework. Uh, so the social cognitive theory framework uh, ties in the environment, it ties in the consequences, it ties in behavioralist theory and people's behavior and uh, all of these kind of stimuli that we were talking about. So essentially it uh, tries to mix in everything and it also tries to solve the uh, kind of uh, cause and effect problem by tying both in together.